everybody, and welcome to Gen Friends. I'm your host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. And we have quite the panel tonight, as you can see. I am so excited to have this full house. Um, I think probably I need to introduce Dan Earl since he's our newest panelist. So, Dan, welcome to Gen Friends, being the only male that we have. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let us scare you. Your blog is the Family History Guy, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Well, we are very, very excited to have you join us, and I'm hope excited you can, to be here. Hope you can put up with our madness and all our shenanigans. <laughs> so we figured if there was somebody to come and put up with madness and shenanigans, it would be you. So that's true. I thrive in madness and shenanigans. <laughs> okay. Well, we're so glad you're here. Uh, Laura Hedgecock is joining us tonight from Treasure Chest of Memories. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm doing good. I have my Irish hat on. I see that. I see that. A little bit of Irish. <laughs> we have uh, it's, Shelley. It's Hurst. in substitute for knowledge. A substitute for knowledge. I get you. All right. We have, we have Shelly Murphy, our family tree girl. Hi, Shelly. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to join us. And Christine Woodcock is back. She's in the house tonight. Hey, Christine. Hey. Happy to be here. I notice I'm the only one not wearing green, but I'm ah. Scottish, so. Is this in rebellion? Is this in rebellion? For <laughs> Same thing, right? Uh, right, same exactly. Same thing. Yeah, Close. sometimes, right? And then, last but not least, if, if she's the last one I haven't interviewed, I'm trying to figure out if I've got everybody, is Melissa, yeah. Melissa no, Barker. No, more. there's Mary. That's right. Well, <laughs> Melissa Barker. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> Melissa Barker is here. She's our archive lady. Hello, Melissa. Hello. And also, I have a blog called A Genealogist in the Archives. Exactly. So. Wonderful and blog. I'm not wearing green either, Christine. <laughs> and we know, would you like to tell everybody why you're not wearing green? It's not because you're, you're boycotting Iris, but what would happen if you had on green? If I had on green, <laughs> uh, my head would just like float in the air because I have a green screen behind me. Oh, on green. I mean, she could if she wants. I think it we would want be... you to do that in October for Halloween. <laughs> yeah, Halloween. Please, please do that. Yeah, I'll this do that. Plotting head. <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> and then, last but not least, we have Mary Kircherati from MKR Genealogy. You Hello. forgot Catherine Hello. Logan. Catherine Logan. Catherine, see, I am just see. I'm not used to all these people. I mean, we, we have a full house, and my screen is not showing my full house. Catherine, I love you. I'm sorry. I was going to introduce <laughs> Terry last because Terry was going to talk to us about our Irish ancestors. But hello, yeah, we're Catherine. here. How we're are here. You? Looking for ancestors. Let's uh, find them. I'm telling you, it's a good thing. I've got you guys to keep me <laughs> I straight. Or I know I'd you be. saw my posts recently on Twitter and Facebook. I just threw it out there. About what? To find William Michael Murphy. Oh, okay. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully Terry, Terry O'Connell's in the house. Terry. Yes, a lot of pressure now. Yeah, she's got a lot of pressure because Terry is going to talk to us about Irish research. And you may know Terry because she does the cruise planners. I am going to pull that out no matter what time, no matter if the cruises are not doing well right now. That doesn't mean it's always going to be bad, but also looking uh, for, for, looking finding our finding ancestors. our ancestors guys i just need to be quiet and just let y'all take over <laughs> <laughs> that's what i need to do i just need to we be got quiet. your back and yeah let, you're doing all right and let y'all take over huh okay so terry if you're just starting out with irish ancestry you've just figured out you've got a mac or an o person <laughs> What do you do? What's your first step? How on earth are you going to jump that pond? Is that an okay, decent question to start with? That's a rough question because it really okay. depends on the time frame. Okay. So the sooner that they came here, like if it's in the 1900s, it's probably going to be a lot easier. But if they were like, say, famine immigrants or before, mm -hmm. it's going to be a little bit harder. Um, so yeah, it's, that's an open-ended question. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Can I ask you another kind of crazy question from my sure. family history? So, and I think people have heard this story before. I have this family story. My grandmother says that her Doherty's came over during the famine, mm -hmm. except for they're here before the famine. <laughs> Just <laughs> census after census after census. And then I was doing some history, reading some history of Ireland, and it says that there was a previous 
famine in the late 1700s. There were, I believe there were a few. So I'm wondering if that's where the story came from. Mm -hmm. They could have come from the earlier, the, the one in the 1800s, I think was the, the worst. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I know that there were a few. Okay. So I'm not, maybe, so maybe, because you know what they say about family well, stories. <laughs> yeah. They say about family stories is sometimes a kernel of it's true mm -hmm. and it just gets expanded. But see, she didn't know her parents or her grandparents because they all died when she was young. So those stories, I think, just ballooned. And then as she read things in the newspapers about Doherty's and Irish famines and all that, she kind of just put the stories together. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's very, it is very possible. Um, yeah. And if it was, uh, one of the earlier famines, it's going to be harder for you to find of course. records because <laughs> there's a lack of records. Um, and when you're going into, you know, pre-1864, anything before, it's church records. Ah, uh, yes. And then if they're Catholic, you know. Right, harder to get to. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's much harder. Um, so civil registration starts in Ireland for everyone in mm -hmm. 1864. Okay. So that's your birth, marriage, and right. death records, what we would call the vital records. They call it civil registration. So anything before that is going to be church. Every, anything before that is going to yeah. be church, except for um, the Church of Ireland um, people. They were being registered 18, I want to say it's 1845. I don't have it in front of me. Um, but I want to say they started in 1845, and then they, everybody was 1864. Okay. So pre-1864, if you uh, were Catholic, you just, I guess, weren't a person. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I believe that, I mean, they were not Catholic, um, family story not Catholic when they mm -hmm. got to the States, nor did they raise their families Catholic. Okay. It's all Protestant, so... So you might have better luck in records than the Catholics do. Okay. But do you then know... But the then county? again, but then again, see, I, I, no, I don't. And that's the problem. And so I just, I've got to make that leap and see if I can make those connections with them. Yeah. And it's going to yeah. be hard because they're, they've been here for so long. For so long. So basically you find your, find your immigrant ancestor and start reading the town histories of where they're at. Okay. Okay. Look at um, old headstones, see mm -hmm. if it's on there. Okay. Well, thanks for those tips. Mm -hmm. All right. All y'all people that are on this panel, I know you've got some, I know you've got some questions about Irish research. Fire away. <laughs> I have one since you just spoke about, you mentioned about the Catholic and the Protestant. Mm -hmm. And so I have that in my family and, you know, it's a whole big thing. But as far as the records, like when those two, um, a Protestant and a Catholic happened to marry, mm -hmm. was there second? <laughs> well, they did. They or go did. to jail for doing it. <laughs> well, they, they got ousted per se, from each side of the family. Of course. And, uh, you know, and that tradition is still holding somewhat, too. Um, and, and both of the, the couple, this is my son-in-law's parents, they've passed, but even at the funerals, they were on opposite sides of the church. It mm. was just, it's you sad. know, I saw a picture, so it was just crazy for me to see that. But my question is, when that happens, is there a separate recording or anything or no nothing so or... you basically have to look at both church records oh okay Sorry to <laughs> it's very so some couples and i've seen this and you can see it in um census records if a catholic and a protestant marry sometimes what they'll do is like the first kid's catholic the second kid's protestant and they go back and forth uh... so that the um both of the religions are staying in the family. It makes absolutely no sense to me with today's mind frame. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that's how you kept your family happy, right? Some of the kids were at least going to be- The normal. kids took no religion. Yeah. That, that's what the three kids did. But, really? but again, I wasn't sure I'm trying to research his line and it's, I'm lost per se. Yeah. You and know, I mean, huh? What time frame is it? Um, they would have got married in the 70s. Like 1870s? No, 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 no. Okay. 19, I'm going back. Wow. Yeah, I'm going back. Okay. And it's a common name. It's not anything, um, you know, unusual. Just a very, McVeigh is one of the names and Smith's Might is, is the other name. So it's not uncommon 
we know everybody's around is Belfast, you know, the whole okay. nine yards. Okay. So, so you yeah. have so much more on top of that because now you have the, the whole North versus the Republic. Correct. Situation. I was trying not to do that. <laughs> Just stay in Belfast because as long as everybody knows, everybody's been in that same area. Hmm. And so for us over here in the U.S., that would be a bonus. I mm -hmm. don't know if that's a, you know, if your family didn't move, mm -hmm. you know, there was no migrations, you know, the North, South or any of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much as far as I've gotten, they're all in the same area of Belfast. Uh, well, that's kind of good for you. So hopefully as you go back further, um, it will be, the will be right there. <laughs> I could only wish for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else got a question? Oh, Dan's got a question. All just, right. Just chime right in, Dan. Just, just chime talk right all in. over all of us. We don't care. All right. Well, I was trying to be polite. You <laughs> I know. know. You'll get used to it. You'll get all over right. that. You'll get well, over that. Give it a couple episodes. Cure me of my politeness. All right. Yeah, so, you, Dan. Let's go. All right. So I have an ancestor named Patrick McMahon who emigrated from Ireland to Canada in the uh, probably 1820s, okay. would be my guess. Um, I know from his brother Martin's gravestone that they that they came from County Clare. So I thought, well, how many Patrick McMahons with brothers named Martin McMahon could there be in County Clare? At least so, five hundred. Right. So I'm looking for a needle in a stack of needles. So any <laughs> tips on how to find my needle amongst all of the needles in Ireland? And I suspect I'm probably not the only person no. that is searching for for that elusive needle. So I will tell you that my names are all the same: John and Dennis O'Connell. And they repeat. So know that when you go back and you're looking there, the names are going to repeat, right? All the cousins are, you're, you're going to have a lot of the same names. Um, so Patrick McMahon, when he's in the States, do you have any information on siblings? Uh, just his brother, Martin. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I was hoping, you know, you always look for that one sibling that doesn't have a common name, right? Yeah. Um, so what you want to do is look at both of their families and look at how they named their kids. Like the Scottish, the Irish have a naming pattern and it's the, the first son is named after the father's father, the second son, um, son is after the mother's father, the first daughter's after the mother's mother, the second daughter's after the father's mother. If you Google it, you can find the, the whole way it goes down. So know that as you're looking for Patrick and Martin McMahon, you're going to find a ton of them because, right, all the brothers are naming their kids the same thing. You have to pretty much, this is, it's sad to give this advice, but you, pr you pr probably have to go through that whole county and pull out all the McMahons. And when you put them in a spreadsheet, don't even put them in a family tree, put them in a spreadsheet and you'll see those families start to develop. When you see those families start to develop, you can see how they're naming their kids and see if there's anything that's jumping out as you, at you as you go through those names. That's your best bet for starting. Um, of course, now it's the whole county. Oof. It's not gonna be easy and it's gonna take a long time. And it's early. I'm, it's gonna, early. I'm gonna chime in here. I'm gonna chime in here because Deanne said a magic word. He said Canada. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he said, and then he said 1820s. Mm -hmm. So that also rings a bell when you're looking at Irish ancestors. It's possible, highly possible, they came under some sort of a um, settlement scheme. Mm -hmm. So I would be looking to see if you can find out if that's a possibility. Two, uh, two really big ones were um, the Peter Robinson um, settlement schemes, but there were a number of other ones as well. Do you know where they came to in Canada? Uh, Tilbury. So just, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you know how long they were here for before they emigrated to the United States, before they migrated? Mm -hmm. again? That's, that's the, that's the fun part. So okay. they, 
they liked to uh, swim across the Detroit River to have babies in Detroit, and then they'd <laughs> swim on back to Canada and live their lives. Yep, um, of course they and did. So, right. so some of the kids were born in they Detroit. Were no boats. <laughs> right. Well, I, I just imagine, you know, the husband, of course, a good husband, just swimming across the river with his wife sort of surfing on his back across, you know, <laughs> before before they built the bridge, you know. Um, <clears throat> but so some of their kids, some of the kids were born in Detroit. Some of them were born in Windsor because apparently they didn't make it all the way to the river. And they're like, well, this is as good a place as any. And <laughs> then, Catholic then, or Protestant? Oh, Catholic. My goodness, okay. Catholic. So the yeah. reason that they're the reason that they're probably going to uh, Detroit is St. Anne's, a Catholic church, okay, which is one of the oldest Catholic church, uh, churches even now in operation. So depending on like that early time frame, they're not, there's not going to be a lot of Catholic churches. Um, there would also be, um, I can't think of the one, there's one in St. Joachim um, that you want to be looking, but I don't know when that one was established. So this is, I've had a similar situation to with my Irish family. They were here early. I can't pinpoint when they were here, but, and I had, all I had for my ancestor was I started out with an only child, which you know full well he's not, <laughs> and, and that he was from Ireland. My strategy was to research all the brothers and sisters. And by going through each and every one of them, I found on a one headstone that the brother was from County, um, was from Sligo. And so now that doesn't necessarily mean my ancestor was born in the same county, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you, you really do, you have to go across and down, you know, all the siblings mm -hmm. and all of their children and take what you know, where they are now in the United States and start going backwards and backwards. Because what happened was when they started, you know, going into Michigan and that they're looking for land. Is what it is so a lot of them that's why they went to the midwestern united states was to get land and you kind of see them moving all over the place so it's some really hard digging um mm -hmm. to find to find who you're looking for and where the where they were in um in ireland and like you said dan trying to determine if that's you know when you find a record is that really your guy Keep in mind too, did he, did him and the wife marry in Canada? Did they marry in America or did they marry in Ireland? Um, it, it appears that they married in Ireland just because their, their oldest child was born and also born in Ireland. Okay. So that would, that would be my guess. But I mean, we all know that children are not a prerequisite for, or marriage is not a prerequisite for children. So. <laughs> um, and what is the wife's maiden name? Kelly. Oh, cool. <laughs> of course it is. Get it, I'm out on Kelly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, let's see. But you could look actually look at, um, I mean, if you get an, a sense for the county, if you can find anything that with a gravestone or something, you may look at the parishes. You can look at Griffiths, where Kelly's and you said McMahon. McMahon, yeah. McMahon's lived the parishes because you will get a smaller number of those than you will, um, you know, that that intersection where both Kelly's and McMahon's are. So okay. that's another helpful. Here is something that might be helpful to you. RootsIreland.ie is a great um, place to search for records. Okay. I just did a quick search on Patrick McMahon. Now you would think that there would be a ton of baptismals for him. There are only 38 listed. It is a paid site. Um, you can do it per day, per month, or per year. I believe it's $17 to do it per day. So if you got a day to sit here and go through these records, I would do that. And I would also do a search for McMahon and Kelly and see what you can find together. Maybe you can find a marriage. It seems seems like I may have a couple of free weeks coming up. So. Yeah. yeah, we all, buddy. We yeah. all got a couple of free weeks coming yeah. up. So, okay, now okay, you're going to have to do this and report back to us. All right, yeah. I will report back. Okay, I have a suggestion for Dan though. If you have if you haven't already done so, go to the Library and Archives Canada website, and you want to look for the section in immigration for immigration before 1865. They do have um, some records indexed that you can do by name search. Researching for 1865 is hard 
because the government, um, the ship manifest didn't have to be kept by law before 1865, but it's at least something that you can um, at least cross off your research list, even if you don't find anything, but at least you could, you could say, okay, I did it, negative research, what have you. But it's worth a shot because you just never know what you might find. Catherine, wasn't there a Peter Robinson scheme down in Tilbury area? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there were a number, there were, like the, I said, there were a number of emigration uh, schemes, especially around like the 1820s, 1830s, like before the Great Hunger. So yeah. um, that's where you're going to have to do a little bit of background research. Um, like, I don't know about, I know more of the French Canadian population out in Tilbury than I do with the Irish population. I do know there's Irish there. So I would be looking at some local history um, and also get in touch with, well, Tilbury, depends on what part of Tilbury we're there, because Tilbury's right on the boundary between Essex oh, County and yeah. County. <laughs> oh, trust me, I know. I yes. know that, yeah. So you would want to, I would suggest also getting in contact with the Essex and Kent County branches of Ontario Ancestors and okay. see maybe if they can help you as well. Awesome. Wow. That's some great stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully, I love this crowdsourcing amongst gen friends so we can help each other find our ancestors. That was fabulous. Anybody else got a question for, for Terry? I, I do. It's not as specific. I was just wondering if, because Catherine mentioned before that people came into the Midwest looking for land. Matt has ancestors that I haven't gotten too far with that I suspect are Irish, they're Cunninghams. And they started out in Ohio, went to Illinois, and then they came to Michigan. I was just wondering, does that fit some known pattern of, of Irish immigrants? Were they likely to have come in through Canada? I haven't found anything for them, come, but from what you're saying, maybe I never will. So between, um... 1776 and 1840 anybody from the UK it was easier because we were still a colony it was easier for them to part of yeah it's still, still a colony it was easier for them to get passage into Canada in order to get into the United States it wasn't until 1840 when the great hunger was happening and there was such a massive exodus that the ships started going back into the eastern seaboard on a regular basis and and the price of that then came down because it wasn't supply and demand kind of thing right so a lot of them laura did come in um through and because um uh it's a great lakes system as well right so they came in they'd come down the saint lawrence into the great lakes and then usually head down right into uh sort of the um uh, Michigan, Ohio area. But some and just also, yeah, okay. I was just going to say, this might is, have, sorry, Mary. Okay, go. I, I was going to say some actually went through New Orleans. Um, that was another port. And if you find them in Ohio, um, you know, they might have sailed up the Mississippi and, and settled Ohio. So at least keep okay. that in mind to look at those New Orleans passenger lists. Oh, okay. That's interesting. That is very interesting. New Orleans to Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> right, right up the Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, my my Irish guy it. came through through Castle Island. Oh. And then that was the only time he, for that I can tell that he was in the United States. Huh. Well, I think I have another dilemma with Indian territory. And, and I have not done the research either. So that's why the questions have come up. But I know there was mass, mass immigration, per se, or influx uh, Irish into Indian territory. I have not locked that down to have a time frame to work in. But Murphy is like Johnson, Smith, and Jones in Indian <laughs> territory. So it's almost like I'm going to leave this ancestor alone. Be, you know, it's been 20 years and I, he, he doesn't exist. And, but again, I'm learning that and I'm thinking, well, how am I even going to find out? I don't know if he's white, mixed, native, or, or whatever that I'm looking for because I don't have anything but a name mm -hmm. and, and a location. And there's probably hundreds of them with that name mm -hmm. 
in that location. Um, and then tough. again, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my grandfather <clears throat> could have been telling a story about where his daddy was born. <laughs> so again, it's up in the air, but I think there's history, you know, learning about them entering in to different, I'm going to say states, Indian territory or whatever. And I think that might help with some of the research as well. Modern day Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I'm out on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, there was no something clue. and I don't know what made a bunch go and I don't know what period. So if uh, somebody knows, Mary, <laughs> do you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's the, uh, Murphy is not one I would want to follow. <laughs> Just, I'll give them to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll give them to you. I need I to ask Angela Walton Raji because she knows that history of that Indian. Yeah. There uh, may, there may know, have Indian been something. Territory. There may have been something posted in newspapers encouraging people yeah. to go to that area. You know, you might yeah. be able to find something like that. Did I see somebody get ready to say something? Or Melissa, were you? Yes. I what have two that? questions. Um, my first one is sort of along the lines of Laura's. Um, my husband has Irish. I do not have Irish, but my my uh, husband has Irish. The Wren family, W-R-E-N, is an anglicized form of O-R-I-N-N o -R -I -N -N or R-I-N-N. Um, I have been able to trace the family back to Osborne Sherman Wren, born in 1813 in Roan County, North Carolina. I can't get past that. And so that is an interesting, I'm wondering, you know, 1813, I was listening to you talk about dates and, and things like that. So I'm not sure how that particular family got here, um, why they were, he was born in North Carolina. I don't know his parents' names, so I haven't been able to get past that. There's that, but the second question is more from an archive standpoint. Uh, and it's very kind of, unusual that we're having this discussion tonight because in light of what's happened here locally. Um, where I live is in Houston County, Tennessee. Uh, our uh, capital city is Erin. E-R-I-N. Um, the, re the, the, the story is, the history is, is that back in the 1850s, we were established in 1871, but in the 1850s before the Civil War, when the railroad came through here, was built through here, it was built by Irish railroad workers. Um, and those Irish railroad workers, when they saw the terrain here, said it reminded them of Ireland and named the city Erin. Hmm. And so this very week, we usually, for the past 58 years, celebrate Irish week because uh. of St. Patrick's Day, which, which culminates in a grand parade on Saturday. Our little county of little over 8,000 people swells to 30,000 people. We're one of the wow. top 10 Irish celebrations in the United States. Wow. We just canceled it. Yeah. First time in 58 years. Mm. And we're going to do, we're going to kind of do it in October. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so my question about that is, is from the archive standpoint, um, do you know of any records or repositories other than railroad repositories that might have records on the Irish railroad workers? Mm. The reason I'm asking is because uh, I get lots of questions in the archives of people who were looking for their Irish ancestors that came through here when they built the railroad. Mm -hmm. We believe there is a piece of property here that um, is in, you know, personal hands that a lot of the Irish railroad workers that died when they were here were buried, but there's no headstones. I mean, you can't even tell there's a cemetery there and it's on personal property. So that's just, you know, a question I thought I'd throw out there. I don't know anything um, off the top of my head, but I just did it like a quick Google search. There are a ton of articles out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Um, was there was there an Irish association around the railroad workers that may have something? Was there a newspaper that they put together? They weren't here that them? long. Okay. You know, they were here long enough to build the railroad. Like I said, mm -hmm. some of them died, so they were buried yeah. here. 
Um, I have been doing some research with the particular railroads. There's the LNN, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big archives in Kentucky for them. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it's just from an archivist standpoint, because like I said, I right. get this question, especially this time of year. Oh, yeah. When we have the Irish celebration, but I didn't know with Irish research, we were talking about that tonight. If anyone knew of any record sources that I don't know about, because believe me, there's a lot I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> Melissa, there are, um, I actually just took a course that's on Future Learn. Uh, so it's an open source um, website where you can do the, the universities uh, put together. I think they're primarily out of the UK, but they put together, say, four week or six week courses. Mm -hmm. And one of them was on railway. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you so find they, the link or something to that? I will, yeah. So, okay. um, it, I, you know what, I took, I took that, I took textile workers and coal, and out of all of them, um, that was the most difficult for me because I didn't understand enough about it. But there are uh, places uh, in all countries where they have an association. So let me go back and revisit that for you. Please, and if you. I can find one for Ireland, I'll certainly let you know. Yeah, and if you do, put it, in our, put it in our chat and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, because uh, like yeah. I said, we... we We've always said we've been, we were named for what we were named and a lot yeah. of the Irish railroad workers mm -hmm. were through here. And I mean, we've had, we had Scottish, we've had English, you know, English yeah. at the same time, but, but that's, we celebrate it every single year in our little wow. bit of county. Yeah. That's great. I would so, also look for, just like do some Google searches on like the, um, the Central Railroad Archives mm -hmm. and the UP Archives, because um, in the Google search, it looks like those are the first two that pop up. Yeah, the railroad that was built here was the um, the Louisville. I think it's the Louisville and Memphis. It was then it was renamed the Louisville and Nashville, the L and N. So, so I might look at the there's the Louisville. Um, let's see, uh, the Kentucky Irish American newspaper published it in Louisville, ah. mm -hmm. and they may. It looks like it didn't start till 1898. But yeah, if there was absolutely. an anniversary, a uh, mm, hundred okay. years, there yeah. may have been a res retrospective article or something yeah. about it. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah, like yeah. I said, it uh, was, we weren't formed until 1871, but the railroad and the Irish came through here about the 1850s building the railroad. Yeah. Those are great. You guys are so good. You throw out something and, and everybody's got <laughs> some, something uh, to yeah. help out with. Um, are there tips, Terry? Are there tips that you would like to? Is anybody else got a question for ask her about the tips? So, anybody else want to ask Terry something? I don't want to. Okay. So I'm kind tips. of glad they got some hard ones. Yeah, some <laughs> hard ones. But but between everybody, I think everybody got some great suggestions. I know sometimes that's what it takes mm -hmm. when we get stuck is oh, to ask. Well, and, Laura's and, got her hand up. Oh, oh, Laura, a group of people. Okay, Laura. So as an expert in Irish genealogy, what are some of the funniest questions that people tend to ask you? I know Lara Diamond, she always has her, her funny questions that people come up and say, I think I'm Jewish because, just wondering if you have any out there questions that people generally come to you with about their Irish genealogy. I mean, I wouldn't say funny, but the most common is, <laughs> I'm Irish. I'm going to Ireland in two weeks, and I want to know where my people come from. <laughs> and then in two weeks, we get a lot of that. <laughs> in two weeks, so you have plenty of time. <laughs> we usually, at this point, laugh, and we're like, "Yeah, you should have came to us a year ago." <laughs> um, and we do our best to get them as close as we can. I mean, if we can get them a county, we can get them a county. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think there's really any funny. I think everybody always comes in with good questions if they know the family. If they don't know. Um, you always have to laugh as they call their dad or their mom and, okay, I need like grandpa's blah, 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 blah. I'm working with this lady and she's trying to find them. Um, you know, I just appreciate every question because I think, as you all know, it's so important to, to find these stories, find where your people came from, go back, see those places, walk their land. So I don't see any question as funny per se um you know well terry remind everybody where you um you you volunteer in chicago so i volunteer at the irish american heritage center um we have a lot going on there normally <laughs> 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 this month not so much mm -hmm. um i've been volunteering there for about eight years roughly about a year ago i took over their genealogy group 
Um, and by took over, really, it just means I'm managing it. <laughs> um, so we meet the last Sunday of the month in the library from one to three. It's pretty much open to everybody. Um, we normally have meetings once a month on the third Thursday from seven to nine. It's, it's more of a workshop. Um, like this week, we were supposed to talk about the National Archives Ireland. Um, yeah, it's not happening because we've got a social distance. Can't, can't go see everybody. Um, and pretty much I, we sit around a big table in the library and I put my computer up on the TV and like, this is what we're talking about. And I really just go around the room and help everybody try to find their people. Mm -hmm. Um, or the one for the National Archives is more like, look what's out there for you to look at. It's just to remind people to go outside of the church records and the civil registration or, um, Griffith's valuation. Then we also have research night, which is the first Thursday of the month, really just opens the library. It makes our books available to members to come in. You don't have to research in your jammies. Um, join us and let's just have somebody to bounce ideas off of if you need to. So but we you could wear your jammies if you wanted. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay, need to see you in your jammies. Um, we could be in our jammies now for all you that's know. That's all you know. That's right. Listen, I got, I got, I got heart jammies on. Yeah, it's like yoga, yoga pants, the nicer shirt. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Every exactly. gen friends, people. <laughs> we exactly. <look> here up. <laughs> so, so we're doing a lot. Um, we just had the Ulster Historical Foundation in for a full day event. I, if they come to your area, really, it doesn't matter where in Ireland your people are from, go and listen to their day of lectures because you learn so much. They could give the same lecture twice while they're here. Right. And I'm still going to learn something at yep. each different one. Yep. Um, they do a tour throughout the U.S. every March. Go and see them if they're close okay. to you. That's fabulous. All right, Terry, give us your top tip, if you have to give top three, whatever, but at least your top tip for researching in Ireland. So you can't jump the pond too early. Mm. You have to really do your fan club research here in the United States. As Catherine said, go across, go down, go up. Find every single piece of evidence that you can, because with the Irish, you do, and probably with all the other nationalities too, right? You don't know where you're going to find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did some research for a friend who is a local, um, well, she's running for office now, but she was, she's a local comedian that I went to grammar school with, and I did some research on her dad's line to find where they were coming. And once I found where they were buried, we went to the cemeteries, because it could very well be on the stone. Mm -hmm. Of course it wasn't. Of course not. <laughs> but I found the info anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, you just never know where you're going to find it. So that's my, the first one is, is really reach out all those records. Okay. The town histories, the county histories, um, work records, union records, get all of that. Um, that's my top one. The second one is, is you have to figure out the religious denomination. It's very important with your Irish research. You can't just go in willy-nilly and be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. He was Catholic if you don't really know. Okay. The other thing to know, though, is because you were supposed to be Church of Ireland, they could be in both record sets. Right. They could be Catholic, but they could be paying the tithe to the Church of Ireland. Mm -hmm. So make sure you look at both. That's interesting. Um, and then my favorite is if, they're, if you're looking in the mid-1800s, don't forget to use Griffith's valuation. It's a great tool. You get to um, and that's really a tax. That's a tax tool, right? Yes, it is yes. Um, for tax. But if you so if you find them in it, you can click on one page. It shows what they paid in tax, what they were, what their holdings were, basically, what were they renting, and then you click on the next picture, and it gives you um, a big map with a red square and somewhere in that red square is where they're supposed to be. Now, sometimes they've been found outside the red square. So <laughs> things happen. How dare they? <laughs> I know. Um, but once you, you know, drill into it and find them, there's a button to click that gives you um, like the global map today. Like you, the, what's the word? What's the word? It gives you like today's Google map. Like when oh, you okay. click on it and you can see 
that there really is no difference from that 1850 era map to today's map. The roads oh, wow. are still the same, the house is still there. Wow. It's amazing if you can find where your people are from. My people, I have them on it. Their numbering is not on the map, mm -hmm. so I cannot place them, oh, but I know the area I've walked area, yeah. with. So it's, it's an amazing um, piece to look at. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Before we end, and, and what we'd like for you to do, our, our viewers, if you've got some questions, you know, as you watch, either put them on the blog post or, or um, on YouTube, and we'll try to forward them on to Terry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> say, Terry, our Irish expert, how do you answer these questions? Or maybe somebody else in the panel can do that. So we would love to get your, your um, questions as well. But um, Chris had asked for us to kind of take a little bit of a uh, a detour um, for tonight with everything that's going on uh, in our country and talk about some of the hardships that our ancestors had to face. So Chris, would you would you come on and unmute yourself and, and get us started with that? You know, we're living in absolutely extraordinary times. And I have to say that the last, what, 45 minutes or so have just been um, so refreshing because we're back to doing what we're passionate about yeah, and back to normal. we're back with our friends and yeah. you know, we haven't really noticed that the world beyond our walls is like we've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got the coronavirus for those who are generations from now listening in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's called COVID-19. It is, has been declared a world pandemic. Um, it, it has consumed everybody. It has consumed the news, it has consumed social media, um, it has put fear and worry and all kinds of other things into people. And it, you know, it really has made me stop and think, how did they cope? They didn't have the same, they couldn't just, you know, Google what's the information. Right. Right. Um, or turn, or they, turn on Disney Plus and get the kids, and get the away kids from happy. It. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I was thinking today because um, there was something on the news that, you know, if um, uh, one of the uh, provincial ministers of health here in Canada has tested positive. Mm. And so she was talking about how she's quarantined herself in her house, away from her children. She has young children and away from her husband and all that mm. sort of stuff. And I thought, remember the days when they put a cue on your door to say you were quarantined? Right? Like, what did yeah. that feel like when that went up there? Yeah. It's just, it's really just given me a real, not a different perspective, mm -hmm. but really, really raised questions about, oh my gosh, how did they cope? How did they cope? And you know, that's something to think about because, you know, we hear about people that are self-quarantined. We're like, oh, good for them. But I'll bet for our ancestors, when that queue went up, there was like, oh, good for them. They're, they're pulling away and, and helping the Absolutely. rest of us not get sick. They were shunned ostracized yep. yeah absolutely yeah so but, but in think today's about world it, they had less than we had also exactly people now are more in a panic <clears throat> trying to figure out what to do with their kids mm -hmm. what games or toys to do because we've lost all of that yeah you know from when i'm going to say when i was a kid yeah you know you were outside playing That's right you know there wasn't an internet when i was a kid there wasn't we we had books mm -hmm. you, you know in games mm -hmm. but i don't think parents today know what to do with their kids <laughs> or, or what they do you know what i'm yeah. saying yeah i know different than yeah. what our ancestors you think about colonial period there wasn't a piece of metal in any toy those kids would have touched <laughs> you know it would yeah. have been just wood yeah. you know or something yeah. like that yeah. so it we've gotten away from a lot of things and it's going to be tough. It, it's, it's really going to be well, tough. You know, you think about people now, they have five bedroom homes. It's easy yeah. to, it's yeah. easy to quarantine. quarantine. How do you do that when you've got six people living in one room? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right? That's why everybody was getting oh, sick. Whole families absolutely. were getting sick. Yeah. Which is but even worse. Like, think... that, like, they didn't have telephones. They didn't have the internet. Yeah. They didn't have it's... FaceTime. I mean, they didn't have information. That's right. The yeah. They didn't have the science. Exactly. But I mean, like, they well, didn't have the CDC. So they didn't yeah. understand what was happening. And a lot right. of times they weren't even sure that what they were doing was going to be was helpful. Mm -hmm. You right. have to think we, how but... scary that <laughs> is when you don't have Say what, Christine? I said neither do we necessarily. Well, at least we're trying. I mean, at least Absolutely. the world well, is we're trying. It on, we're basing it on expert advice. They didn't even have that, as exactly. Laura said, right? Exactly. That's my point, but, yes. Yeah. But one of the things they did have 
often is um, maybe a stronger community. I mean, when you think of the movement yeah. of families and I don't live near my family um, and I haven't, I mean, I didn't raise my kids near where I grew up because we moved somewhere else. And so, you know, back in the day, I think families tended to stay closer. So you might've had your mom or your aunt close by. My my son lives overseas, and and he's a teacher, just like his mother. But he's a teacher. Uh, he lives in Japan in Hiroshima, and and they had wow. cl- of course closed down all the schools. What was interesting, and it hasn't happened here, but all the teachers were given thermometers. Mm. They had to take their temperature every day and call it in. Wow! And I thought, you know what? That's we proactive. we could be mm-hmm. doing that, to, you know. Number one to keep keep us calmer, a little calmer, watching the temperature. But as far as you know, how they're communicating, of course, the phones, the internet, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But they have to check in every one of the teachers for the school he teaches for to report their temperature every morning and they've well, done it, it the last them some two weeks. control over it, right? Yeah. Huh? Exactly. It gives them self-control over yes. it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, think about how many of you have traveled recently and are you watching like your friends' Facebook feeds to see if they're sick? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. We I'm only watching were, Mary up there. We're a lot of us were just <laughs> from Roots Tech. Roots Tech. Yeah. I don't yeah, think anybody, Roots Tech. We should yeah. be we should bar, be far enough beyond Roots Tech that we should. We be are now. Worry. Yeah. But yeah. But I thought about day, that. The other day, Finn posted that he was enough. sick and I like freaked out because who? I sat with him twice. <laughs> who, who posted that he was sick? Fisher. Oh, yes. 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 So well, I kind of have a different, a little bit of a different um, thought okay. that I had today. And uh, maybe it's just because of the work that I do, but being an archivist and a public historian, one of the things that I was talking to my husband about yesterday was, you know, which a lot of people are, and it was in a weird way, I guess, I don't know, but c- comparing the influence of, of 1918 to today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that I actually thought of was wonder what, because I'm not a student of the influenza epidemic of, of or pandemic of 1918. I wonder what we as a society are going to carry with us into the future mm-hmm. that we're going to do differently that in a hundred years from now, our descendants are going to go, well, why did they do that? Because I don't know what came from the 1918 pandemic that we do today that started during that pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. But whatever becomes our new normal, right? Yeah. Yes. That's my thought process being the historian that I am an archivist. I'm thinking, what are we going to carry forward? That's what we did like the Ebola. Mm -hmm. So we did carry something forward what you're describing and things were put in place. Mm -hmm. Some of those things got undone, Mm. but there were things that were put, well, HIV was another one, but the Ebola one, I think was the bigger one, not quite on this scale, but it was pretty big, but we had lessons learned, Mm -hmm. but we also forget quickly. And and another thing that that I'm not equating this, but one thing that made me think of this was I remembered my grandmother. My grandmother was, came up through the depression, like many of our ancestors did. And one thing that she continued to do, which she did not have to do, is that when she would go to the butcher and she would get her package of meat, it had string tied around it. Mm-hmm. She still, until her dying day, saved the string. Saved the string. Huh. When she wow. I know people that were like that as well. Yeah. I know yeah. people that never got over hoarding. Yeah. And that's what I'm 30. talking about, about carrying things forward. forward. And yeah. then so the future historians, the future archivists, the future mm-hmm. genealogists, we're going to look at what our ancestors did and wonder, well, why did they do why that? They do well, that? it may be traced back to the coronavirus of 2020. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the same with 9-11, right? Like yes. all the airports. Yes. 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 You know, it's funny, my mom grew up uh, post-war mm-hmm. um, and they had rations for fruit. And she says she remembers standing, she got, she got sick um, one year when my grandmother was over. And I said to her, you need to get some orange juice. She was feeling really like weak. I said to her, you need to get an orange into you. And my grandmother said she wouldn't put an orange past her lips. 
And my mom said, you know, we used to stand in line. The fruit man would be there and we'd have our little ration book and we'd stand in line for an hour and a half, two hours. And it would be uh, our turn. And then they would give us oranges that were meant for marmalade. Oh, and so she uh, never ate an orange after that uh, because she was always afraid it was going to be horrendous. Right. Right. Mm. So, yeah. That, so, isn't that something? Yeah. These yeah. things do, they really do. Affect we got to write these down, man. We do. I know. Well, we gotta, do. <laughs> we you know, do. I asked, yeah. Go ahead. I asked my mom about depression she's born in 1930 mm -hmm. but she made a comment to my brother and i she said well we didn't have toilet paper as kids till i was about six or seven years old because she was talking about what is it with all this hype she, we she didn't doesn't have, have it now either <laughs> oh she's oh no <laughs> i think they're gonna look <laughs> back and say what's in there thinking? now <laughs> It's it's there. it's there, but she said she was six or seven years old before they saw toilet paper oh, wow. rolls and oh, things yeah. like that. And I thought, oh my god, wow. you know, things we take for granted. Eh? Things we yeah. take for granted. Dan, and so much. Go, go, you're Dan's right. got his hand out. Oh, oh yeah. sorry, Dan. Sorry, I'm being polite again. I'm sorry. Yeah, just <laughs> jump in. Just jump in. <laughs> I thought it would be the Canadians that would be apologizing for not being. <laughs> I guess it's the we Michiganders gotta, too. Hey, all right. Get in, Kathy. So, so not only is it I think important for us as genealogists to to record what's happening now, mm -hmm. but also to disseminate what happened, right? Stories from the past, because that's mm -hmm. really what we can do as a genealogical community to help kind of calm people's fears and anxieties, because the more they can understand themselves in sort of this intergenerational context of we're survivors and we did tough things, whether that's right. the flu pandemic or the depression mm -hmm. or, or even the Salem witch trials, right? Anytime right. you have these sort of panics that people mm -hmm. work themselves into that, especially those of us that have younger people at home or that right. have other younger people that we care about, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, to take time to share those stories, I think is also really important for us as family historians, because that has been scientifically proven to help ease anxiety when you can place yourself in that intergenerational context. So not only should we be writing this yeah. stuff down, but also sharing what we already know. Exactly. I've been encouraging my kids to, to write down what's happening. And I took my, I took my 16 year old daughter to the store yesterday and purposely took her to the toilet paper aisle and to the aisle where the cleaners were and she just couldn't believe it and i said so what you need to do is you need to go home and write down your yeah, feelings you and your experiences mm -hmm. and what you saw during the pandemic and it was really funny because people were listening to me tell her and i said and, and write down how nuts people were <laughs> taking all the toilet paper. and they were all just laughing so she's got that whole moment in the store that she can write down about her experience and what the people around were thinking about it and you know so and that way she's got something to help her process anyway all the stuff that's going on and then something to share with her children and grandchildren one day as she writes all that down. So I think that helps. Yeah. I think Dan's right. Sharing the stories of people who've survived and then writing it down yourself, I think is really a, a good um, way to share and get some of those feelings out as well. And I, I know Laura, you agree with that as a story I'm Terry's teller. being polite at the bottom. Yes. Oh, there she is. All right, Terry. <laughs> So yesterday I had to leave my house. I, <laughs> I do apologize for going out, people. But um, as we were at Target picking up the few things we need and looking for toilet paper <laughs> that they didn't have, and they but told they us they wouldn't have it until May. <gasps> May, okay. Um, you can cross your legs till then. It's fine. I know. Right. We don't need it. <laughs> We have, we have enough to get us through maybe a week and a half. We're good here. But I, um, I did everything. And as we were getting ready to check out, I was like, oh, I need one more thing. And I turned and I went into like the office supplies and I picked up a couple little booklets to mm -hmm. start tracking things. And my daughter's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, we need to journal what's going on because someday like our right. descendants are going to want to know about this coronavirus and what we lived through. She's like, I've already been journaling. I'm like, okay, well, I'll get one. Good. To that. So my husband was sleeping. He'd worked the night before. And like, later in the evening, we came home from dinner because we went to dinner at his mother's house. Um, <laughs> That was before you could only have less than 10 people. So you were less than 10 people. So it, was good. it was good. But I, I said, wait, wait, before you go to bed, I, I need to give you this. And he's like, 
what's this for? And I said, you need to journal what's going on. Now he's a medic. So he's seen a lot. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's like, why am I going to journal this? Like he journals it for work. Like, why do I got to journal it personally? I'm like, listen, like hundred years from now, your descendants are going to want to know what we lived through. And he laughed at me. He goes, okay, I'll do that. (laughs) I thought for sure he was going to be like, you're nuts. I'm not doing it. So I have it. I haven't started mine, but I've got a lot of things. I thought, you know, I want to like print stuff out and tape it in there. Pictures that we've taken at the grocery store with empty aisles. Don't use tape. Don't use tape. Don't use tape. tape. (laughs) (laughs) Let me get my scrapbooking (laughs) supplies out. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Where are they? (laughs) Where are they? Where where are they? Well, and I've even thought about too. You know, a hundred years from now, um, when they walk into my archives, which I won't be there, but the next archivist that's in there, and they say, "Oh, do you have any records on the coronavirus and what happened locally?" You know, so journaling, writing, Mm -hmm, yes, is important. I'm going to save all the memes off of Facebook. Yes, (laughs) save all those memes. Oh my God, that would be that's right. They are hysterical. Who books? (laughs) Yeah. That would One be for me. <laughs> Laura, you and were, I think to yeah. Laura, I was just thinking back something. to Melissa's back to Melissa's earlier thought about what are we going to do differently. I already am wondering about our attitudes toward te- technology, which is already kind of generational. Mm-hmm. But I think people there's a segment of the population that just looks at technology as this thing that divides. Oh, true. And as we're in this crisis and more and more and more of us, I know at my church, I'm struggling to get people to do zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. They're like, we'll see how long we have to be apart. I'm like, it takes me two minutes to set you up a meeting. So I've actually took some screenshots of this to show them because I think we will see. Oh, good. Great. Connection is and face to face are not necessarily synonymous. Always synonymous mm-hmm. that we have these ways to connect, Absolutely. and it's about the ways we connect and not the vehicle for which we use the mm-hmm. vehicle we use to connect, yeah. whether it's technology or meeting or phone calls or whatever it is. I so and I many times, if, yeah, and many times change, change change comes about because you because have of these, to yeah because you have to change. Into it. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will say this, um, when you think about like the, the Spanish flu and all of that, mm-hmm. and you think of, like, okay, like telephones, like how did they, there was no communication, you didn't know, we've already talked about that. Like today I can pop on and I, you know, I sent Christine a message. My daughter's on um, shelter in place in San Francisco. Mm. Like, you know, I'm a hot mess mom. Like, yeah. my, kid, like my kid's out there. I can't right. do anything. I'm like, come home. She's like, uh, you don't get it. I can't leave my house. Yeah. <laughs> and she can't leave her house for 22 days. 22 oh. days. But oh my gosh. Christine, like before I can even type the next message, hit the button and was video chatting me to make sure I'm okay. Yeah. So we do have these great connections. We need to use them. Check on your friends. Check on yes. your neighbors. Check, check on the me. elderly. Yes. Yeah, like check so on. I, you know, that sounds like I'm really compassionate, but I was more like, okay, you got to be on screen in 40 minutes. Let's make sure you're not a hot mess. <laughs> he did say that. Pull your socks up, girlfriend. Have you been in a shower? <laughs> Why would we think Christine was compassionate? <laughs> Christine is very, She's very you know compassionate. She's very compassionate. Yes, Every like, bad moment I've had, that woman has FaceTimed me. To yes, she her. has. She's very compassionate. Don't wonderful. let her fool you. She is wonderful. <laughs> Well, I have one. Very, Go ahead. I was just going to tell okay, one, one last kinda, one last thing, and then we we okay. have been on for a long time. <laughs> yeah. People are going to say we do not want to listen to you people talk anymore. Ahead, one Mary. kind of funny story <laughs> in my family: um, my um, grandmother's brother um, was married. He died in 1920 of consumption, oh. but his wife always insisted that he died from the flu because only those kind of people get consumption so so she used the flu as her excuse wow that's that's like being that's like saying you're widowed when you're really divorced right yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. we can't trust we can't trust any of them can we no that's another lesson that comes from this meeting tonight don't trust your ancestors she also lied about her age for years because she was older than her husband and she didn't want to admit it till she hit 90 and then there was a certain status 
So every birthday she'd age like two or three years instead oh. of just one <laughs> till she finally caught up. Rascally mm -hmm. ancestors. Yeah. We all, all have them. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming. This has been so fun to have everybody here tonight to talk about our Irish ancestors and to talk a little bit about what's going on with our world right now and the, the problems that we're facing. And I just want to wish all of you on the panel and everybody watching a health and safety and uh, we want to send our love out to everybody and hope that somehow as we we keep recording these gen friends it'll give you something to do <laughs> and something to watch and and somehow to participate and uh, take your minds off of all the crazy that's going on in the world and we are a great community the genealogy community is a wonderful loving giving community so we are here to support and love and virtually hug <laughs> everybody out there. And with that, <laughs> and with that, I'd like to say um, goodbye, everybody, and we will see you next time on Gen Friends. Bye. 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 Bye.